Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It's the 22nd of February, 2012, and we've got a really interesting group of people here. Hi, Nick. Nick just got here. Others were here earlier. Can you hear us yet, Nick? Hi. Yeah, good. Um, and our topic tonight is a continuation of last week's show. It's about um, student engagement. It's about um, thinking about dropouts, thinking about alternatives, thinking about different kinds of um, educational structures. Um, is that broad enough? <laughs> I mean, it really is about rethinking the questions, I think, that we've been asking about some of this. Um, and so we've invited some interesting folks. Now, I, and we can introduce them kind of quickly. Todd Finley is here from the East Carolina University. Alex Pappas and Ruby Q is, uh, they're here from the Our School. And Lisa Nielsen is here. Um, Teresa Bunner is here. Teresa, you kind of started this fire. <laughs> I can say it that way, and you maybe you, maybe we'll start with you again. Um, and Nick Perez, uh, Nick, and um, Todd are two very different uh, folks. I think um, Todd Finley has been studying what engagement means. Uh, Troy Hicks is here too, and of course Monica Hardy and Chris Sloan and a couple others may be joining us. Um, but both Nick. And Todd um, contacted us through Google Plus and said, hey, I have a story about engagement. I have a story about uh, um, dropping out. And so maybe what we can do is start with uh, Teresa uh, Bunner. You can tell us uh, what President Obama said that inspired all this again. And then we'll turn to, um, if you don't mind, uh, Todd, because Todd has been sending me really good questions, <laughs> and and to Nick, and then we'll just kind of let this go, see what happens. Fair enough. All right, sounds good. First of all, hi Todd. Hi Lisa. How are you? I'm great. Good. This is this is very Brady Bunch. I know. <laughs> um, so. I love um, I love Twitter and I love the power of Twitter and actually this conversation started um, in the uh, President's State of the Union address when he brought up the issue of making um, 18 the mandatory dropout age and some tweets started going about how can he do that and where's the money going to come from and so you know I'm always one that wants to look at things from you know ask questions and, and multiple viewpoints and I said but aren't we supposed to expect to have them until they're graduating? And so it just started this back and forth conversation about, you know, should, what are we doing in our high schools? Is it, is it a place that kids should be, want to be, could want to be? And it just picked up from there. Um, by the way, um, somebody's typing furiously, and that doesn't work. If, if you could mute yourself when you're doing that, that would be great. Sorry about that. It's sort of uncomfortable to always say that, but it's worth saying. <laughs> and, but we want you to, to chat over at edtechtalk.com slash live, um, but um, kind of mute and in and out. I think that would work. Um, so hey Paul before you start yeah um, everybody in the chat room is saying they can't get audio any advice really hmm well, worth oh I, there's a little thing that we could change how about that <laughs> okay I think they got audio no thank you again uh, okay so even though we were recording, so we can keep going, um, I think they have audio now. Can you check in on that? <laughs> yep. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. 
All right, so um, I don't know. Um, let's let's hear the question. Um, Todd, introduce yourself and tell us why you were interested to get involved in this conversation about engagement and what you've been doing. Okay, I I am uh, Todd Finley. I am an English education professor at East Carolina University and a blogger for Edutopia. And uh, I'm also a former National Writing Project co-director of the Tar River Writing Project. So I feel like I'm here with um, with friends and I, and I follow Paul and Troy quite a bit too. So um, it's, it's fun to see you both and be here. Um, I am uh, not an expert in engagement and that's probably why I'm very interested in this. Um, uh, so I teach English education interns, and we noticed last semester when we were looking at their their field notebooks uh, that they were categorizing uh, instances of uh, the most basic com procedural compliance as uh, as engagement, and uh, we thought this might be uh, was kind of an anemic. Uh, way of thinking about engagement where we think of it as more healthy and robust. So um, Dr. Stebman and I decided that we would look at this more closely and so that led us to collecting all the uh, artifacts that we could that the, our, all of our majors had produced last semester and uh, coding all of it, uh, particularly looking at engagement and then uh, following that we did uh, uh, survey work where we asked them about, uh, asked them to define engagement, asked them about their experiences with engagement, their observations of engagement, just try and um, get an idea of how they were thinking about it. Um, and w one of the joys for me uh, about this was that it gave me a chance for a couple months to just read about engagement and to see how um, how conflicted the literature is on, on what it means. It, so, um, which in some ways I kind of like. Uh, because I think it means that we get to continue the conversation on what engagement is. But uh, the literature is in clear to capitalize on what Lisa said in, in that uh, consistent, consistently people are saying that engagement is epidemic. It, uh, I should say disengagement is epidemic. It's just a, it's just a big problem. Um, and I, so I, I would say that the other part that intrigues me about this is that uh, we talk about engagement a lot as being really important uh, for as a requirement for learning, and and I think that's right. But I think we also maybe assume that uh, people are using certain words to mean the same things, and uh, the evidence that we're collecting suggests that that's not the case. Can can you give some sense of the extremes, like what people are saying engagement is? And thank you for yeah, the, uh, for telling us your research before it's published. <laughs> Sorry. Oh sure. Okay. Um, uh, uh, let's see. So the uh, the question is, um, what is the range? Um, well, s students in their uh, field notebooks have. Uh, are categorizing things as basic as students lifting up their pencils um, and taking notes uh, of a teacher lecturing as being engagement. And um, and then you also have uh, students talking about more um, complicated, rich um, kinds of uh, simulations that teachers are doing where they're really engaged. Um, I should mention also that the uh, that there's a, a range of how our interns are categorizing engagement, but there's it's also not consistent within their own definitions of it. And, and what this uh, partly suggests to me, um, I think, is that um, uh, is that how th there's a certain kind of language that's used in the ivory tower and then a certain kind of language that's used in the um, in the school and so um, in high schools and so when students are um, writing something or talking to the professors about um, 
certain kinds of practices, they privilege uh, more constructivist kind of terminology. And then um, I, I think the, the thinking changes when they go into the high schools. Lots to chew on here. I, I want to get Nick's story in right away here. So maybe Nick, you could speak up and just sort of introduce yourself and tell us your interest in this topic. Okay, um, sure. I'm, a, I'm Nick Perez. I'm a software developer um, and a high school dropout. Um, I'm interested in this conversation because um, I think, I mean, as far as engagement goes, in a high school environment, or like any public school really, um, you need to, like it was always hard for me to know like why I'm supposed to be engaged, like what am I learning and what am I going to do with it? And like from childhood on to like to this day, I've always been self-educating in programming and computer science and I always knew exactly what I was learning and why, what that knowledge was going to be used for. And um, I don't know. I think if you're going to try and get a student engaged in something, like why should they wonder like what it's really for? So many students are just learning to, to get a passing grade so that they can get a college, but um, I'm kind of interested in having more of a focus on um, teaching people things that they're going to apply. And for every single thing that's taught, it should be known like what it's going to be applied towards. And I think that was one of my motivations for dropping out. Um, I want to encourage everybody to jump in here um, with questions and thoughts. Um, Alec, um, I'm sorry, I do want to go to Alexander. Um, do you want to um, quickly get to our school? And and I'm introducing these three pieces, and then we can kind of let it fly from there. Um, our school and the campaign that you guys recently started, the peer teaching campaign. Welcome, Alexander Pappas and Ruby Ku. Thank you. Uh, yeah, sure. So um, my name is Alex, and uh, I am myself and Ruby founded Our School. For those of you who haven't heard of it or don't know, um, OurSchool.com. That's Our with an H, H O U R, um, and it is a platform to help people self-organize small, bite-sized classes. Um, they sort of organize online and then have classes offline. Um, and it is a community building tool. It is a, you know, think of the idea of unlocking the knowledge of your neighborhood or your community, your city, things like that. Um, I think that, uh, you know, as, as I'm hearing this conversation here, so let me talk about the peer, peer teaching fund too really quickly. Um, we just started a, a fund where, so we've had teachers teaching classes on our site for a while now. Um, we're meeting up on our site and then teaching classes in person in a number of cities. Um, and we are very much focused on the, the, ver the core idea that everyone has knowledge to share, that everyone can be a teacher, um, and that everyone also has things they want to learn. Um, you just have to find those interests uh, and things like that. And we're, we're running several programs with um, a transitional housing group here in Austin and, a, um, and the Austin Resource Center for the Homeless. Um, applying that same idea and the same sort of our school model to those places um, and starting this sort of peer teaching uh, notion that, you know, all these people can also be teachers uh, and have tons of knowledge to share and things like that. So we've started a little fund where basically people who are teaching classes on our main community site can actually donate the proceeds of their classes to support us building these programs at the transitional housing place, the homeless shelter, and things like that, and hopefully lots more places in the in the near future. Um, so it's sort of donation through action, 
Um, and that is, you know, it's not donating five bucks online. It's not clicking on something and saying you sign a petition, but it's actually acting, being an active part of your community, donating the proceeds of your knowledge in a way um, to support these funds. Um, and I think to sort of round that out and bring it back to the topic at hand around engagement, you know, um, we, uh, I think we have been talking over the last probably three or four months now with a number of schools. Um, we have a, a small beta program we're running with the University of Texas. Um, I was actually back in Ann Arbor, Michigan for a little while talking with two high schools back there about implementing an hour school type of, ver uh, of site uh, with the high schools. And, you know, in some of these cases, I think, uh, and this probably plays into a lot of, you know, what Monica does as well, is it's all about finding people's passions, finding what they're into. It's not necessarily that, you know, that they want to, dropout is a very strong word. It's, it's you know, it's a, you drop out of high school, but you're still learning. So there's not really like this, it's not an end to learning as it, as it sounds, right? That word has so many negative connotations. Um, and, you know, you, uh, you know, you were saying, Nick, that you're, you found something you're interested in and you're learning it and you're passionate about it and you're, you're doing it professionally. I mean, that's, you know, what more really do we want? I think we need to blur the line a little bit between, um, you know, the, this, this harsh thing, you know, you have to stay in high school until you're 18. Well, maybe, you know, our notion of high school is just a little bit weird um, or too strict. Uh, you know, I think the idea is, is finding people's passions, finding things people are interested in learning, knowledge sharing across the board. A little bit of a ramble, but. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, but do you have anything to, to add, Ruby? <laughs> Welcome. Introduce yourself a little bit. How did you get involved in all this? Uh, so I went to grad school with uh, Alex at Austin Center for the Line last year. And like Alex mentioned, it came out from uh, a research project with um, the Austin Resource Center for the Homeless. And that is sort of how the idea evolved from that to um, the current site and the platform. And like, on the notion of engagement, it's also the same thing we, we saw with um, uh, the homeless population. It's like engagement is very much a deciding factor whether they get out of homelessness really quickly or they become chronically homeless and they just remain in that situation and that cycle. Uh, because they become disengaged with the community, they just become disengaged with life, and they don't want to learn, they don't want to be better, and then they just give up on themselves. So what we found with peer learning and teaching is that it, it brings that engagement back. People, when you're teaching, you have to you have to engage. And when you're learning from your peers, it's a lot, it's very relevant, and it's very motivating to see oh, people that are sort of in your shoes and in your situation um, are teaching you something that they just learned and uh, that really brings uh, that really increases engagement and like it changes a lot of things it changes like the way they see themselves it changes the the path they want to move like move forward like it's it's we think it's really relevant in terms of so like just in terms of running our school and wanting to expand it we are just really interested in um, how other people like what are all the other thoughts out there on um, on the topic of you know engagement and how we can get better at what we do? Okay, and, and I think Karen. I'm going to add one more one more final thought to that really quick. Um, the idea you know of, of being in, it, it makes me think of the idea of being engaged in your community. Um, and again, to bring up the the thing we learned with in our homeless research project was that a lot of these people are just given things and they have no avenues to give back. And I wonder if there's, and I'm just thinking of this for the first time, but if there's, there's parallels there with high school, right, where you are fed a lot of information. The more opportunities you have to give back, whether it's to your fellow students, to your teachers, to your peers, you know, that is a, one way to definitely increase engagement. And I know there's lots of programs that do that, but it's this idea of, you know, changing that one-way street sort of old school mentality. Um, and actually creating a community, right? Uh, that's at the core of a lot of this. I think along with that, Alex, is um, the myth that if we do let people choose, that there's no um, like rigor 
and um, that we're just trying to get away from stress. And I had a conversation with a kid today that I, I that was incredible, and he said that he's like, oh, you mean um, we get to <clears throat> we get to pursue our wanted stress, and just the idea of a wanted stress. I mean, that's the thing that you can't not do, and that you don't need the incentive for. And that you feel like you're giving to your community if it's a wanted stress. Because I do think we crave hard work as, as long as it's work that matters to us. Lisa, do you want to introduce yourself and what have you been thinking about all this? Sure. I think there's two Lisas. Um, do you mean well, Lisa Nielsen? I do. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so Welcome. my name is Lisa Nielsen. I have a blog called The Innovative Educator. I recently published a book called Teaching Generation Text, but most relevant to this conversation is I also uh, produced a guide called The Teenager's Guide to Opting Out of School for Success. And I also have an article coming out in 12 most, um, very, probably uh, in the sometime this month called The 12 Most sensible reasons to let your teen drop out of school. And really, the perspective that I come from is people don't realize that you don't need to attend high school to achieve career or college success. And many of the hoops that people believe they are forced to jump through are actually unnecessary. So um, that's kind of some of the stuff I discuss in the guide, and that will be in the article that's coming out. And I'm happy to discuss any piece of that further if you have a particular question about it. Yeah, we'll go. And please talk to each other too. Nick, did I see you perk up there? Did you want to say something? <laughs> um, that did make me smile, but um, I don't have any questions you, at the moment. What made you smile? Um, just hearing that uh, there's support for students to drop out. I mean, you hear so often, like, stay in school, and it's just, like, considered an automatic that school is a good thing, and you're always going to get something out of it. But um, I just think it's not for everyone. Some people prefer to learn on their own. Some people are really good at that. And I would say, Nick, to just um, give you more support as a high school graduate, I was really frustrated to find out that most of what I was told I needed to know was a lie. And um, while it might be relevant for other people, it didn't help me achieve success in life at all. And I wished I had spent that time doing things that were more relevant to my personal success in life. So kudos to you for being brave enough to do that. <laughs> Thank you. Kind of segues into um, something we've been talking about in the chat room, and that is, you know, the purpose of schooling to begin with. And uh, Troy, I think you've got a few things to say on that topic. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Yeah, there, there's a whole bunch to say here. Um, I, part of what I'm asking here, and I, I really would be interested in hearing individually what everybody here says, like what do we define as the purpose for schooling? And we could look at that on the very like bright side of the continuum, like in our best heart of hearts and when we think about what school is and why people would choose to go there and pay tax dollars and send our children there. Um, what, what are the very positive purposes of schooling? And then we could also say, um, what are the potential negative consequences of schooling too? And one of the things that I want to point out here that I think is really evident, um, you know, coming from these stories that um, Nick and uh, Lisa and others are sharing is the fact that it seems like there's kind of two reasons for dropping out and this is a conversation my wife and I have had we're both career educators and thinking about what we want for our own children and whether or not their schooling is actually providing that for them um, are they able to engage some of the questions here are they actually able to feel like they're in a sense of flow or do they go to school and do they feel this disjointed disconnected set of experiences and do the positive benefits of that 
outweigh the negative of you know being socialized in both good and bad ways but also having access to art and music and different things that we wouldn't be able to provide for them so I, I would be really interested in backing this up a level and thinking about, you know, not only why people drop out in the first place, because there can be positive and negative reasons for do that, but also like, what do we really see as the value of um, schooling? And I'm using schooling intentionally as a word too, instead of education, um, because I think that speaks more to, you know, like what Nick was saying a moment ago, people can learn whatever they want. I mean, by golly, hop on the internet and you can find a community to work with. And I'm sure, you know, Lisa would make that argument too. I'm, I'm looking at her website right now. So anyway, I, I, I'd be curious to hear what everybody's opinion is about that. Thanks for inviting me into the conversation, Chris. And I'm purposely not moderating. Please jump in. I was going to say, I've silenced everybody here. I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Who has a thought? So the purpose of uh, schooling is to make Pearson lots of money. Is that it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, let's. I'm. Yeah, Todd. I think that's great. Like on the one hand, let's put that very cynical side out there because let's face it, that's true. The Common Core standards were designed by the Billionaires Boy Club to increase the amount of standardized testing to fuel the fires that feed the pockets of Pearson and McGraw Hill and all those other things, right? Like we can trace those dollars pretty quickly, mm -hmm. but like in your most generous, like amazing, I really love to be a teacher and want my kids to succeed at school. Like, so what would the other side of that equation be? Well, Paul posted something uh, a few weeks ago that I on Google Plus which was a link to uh, graduates of Summerhill uh, do you remember that that school they, they had its 90 year anniversary I guess a little bit ago which was that idealized notion of uh, of students being truly free and of course it was controversial then and and I guess it closed and uh, fairly recently but um, I, you know, regardless, even with Summerhill, where they where kids had a whole lot of freedom to um, run around naked and play tennis or go, you know, play in the woods for years. Um, re regardless, it's a negotiated space where where a whole bunch of people are put together and they have different agendas, and uh, those agendas need to be to be negotiated. So I think that's a conversation that ha has to happen at the classroom level, and then at however you define the classroom and and then also at the individual level as well and I think that has to be constantly negotiated um, I'm, I'm used to building curriculum castles and and um, I'm surprised when students walk into those castles and think that uh, I'm surprised when oh you mean this isn't as wonderful for you as it was when I was picturing this in my head and um, I, you know I've had that happen for years and years so it is a negotiated space Well, I'll uh, talk about it from an idealist perspective that I think uh, crosses a lot of the you know schooling we're talking about, and you know I think of it uh, as a place where regularly you can encounter uh, beauty and you can um, be feel that, and I think it's it's a place whether it's our school or you know so place uh, it's a place where or in my traditional classroom where we foster curiosity and and students um, you know feel like they can um, explore their curiosity and I think that covers a lot of the models that we have and I'm thinking of Monica's and I'm thinking of the hour school off the top of my head yeah I would add to that too it's you know it's it's exposure to ideas, it's exposure to possibility, it's exposure to topics and, and things. I mean, the first thing I think of, you know, when you, when we talk about this and especially on the, you know, the good, the, the feel good side of it is spend an hour in my mom's classroom. You know, she's a French teacher, a high school teacher, and it's an amazing, hilarious, you know, wonderful place that inspires kids and they do all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, I'm sure they don't a hundred percent all find that it's like, exactly what they need to be doing at all times. 
Uh, but I think it is a truly inspiring place. Um, you know, I had, um, I come from the, from the other side on this conversation because I had a wonderful time in high school. Um, I met a bunch of incredible teachers that I'm still really close friends with. Uh, a bunch of my really, really close friends uh, that I had classes with, I'm still good friends with, and I think I learned a ton. So um, I think, again, it's a, it's a personal thing, and it's, you know, being flexible and having systems and, and outlets and curriculums that are flexible enough to find, you know, people's passions, find their interests, to, to capture that, that thing. You know, I'm I just thinking, and maybe this is not the right way, but, you know, for example, with Nick, like if a teacher had reached out and said, like, Hey, instead of taking these classes that you're not interested, in, why don't you teach start teaching programming classes, right? To like eighth graders or whatever, you know. Like, how can we start engaging in like completely new ways to to actually foster, you know, to to open it up uh, more to be able to do that? And and granted, it's never going to work for everybody, right? There's there's no, I mean, it's it it just isn't. Um, we are too diverse a bunch. Uh, with too many interests and too many things and too many influences to to create one system that works for all. But I think you know flexibility and compassion and and understanding uh, and listening to what the kids are saying and what they want, um, what they're interested in. You know, for crying out loud, like we should have more kids on here. Uh, you know, because it's realistically that's who this is for. Um, now, you know, top down on the evil side of things, that might be a different conversation because that might not be who it's for, but. Uh, I think from where we come from, you know, that's that's who it's for. So let's let's listen to them, you know. So, Nick, do you, do you have a response to that? Yeah, I was hoping Nick would say something about that too. Like, what what were the reasons you felt disengaged in high school? Um. Well, I mean, and. As far as like the value of schooling in general, I think the way I see it is that the value is in um, the community aspect. Like everyone said, like you do have that ability to get in a room with a bunch of people and and see what they have to say and have you know unique experiences in person, which isn't something that can really be done over the internet. But um, I mean the whole like questioning the value of schooling, you get two totally different answers when you ask yourself, what's the value of schooling before the information era and like during the information age? Because um, at this point, public schools have competition. Um, so I feel like in my experiences, the reason it was so difficult for me to be engaged is because I went with the competition. Say more. What do you mean? Um, well, I mean, I guess it all started when I was like 10 years old. I went to this uh, summer camp. It was a computer camp. I had no idea what programming was, but like the first five minutes I was there, they had me writing my first program. Um, so that was like a positive, in-person, engaging educational experience. After, after the summer was over, I went home with a bunch of books, and they weren't teaching me how to code in school. So I'd read my books, go online, go on Google, and uh, continue my education on my own. So it's like this amazing educational experience I had outside of public schools were competing with, um, you know, a standardized curriculum that I didn't really care much for. And they didn't like that. So what happened when they, they didn't like that? Um, well, I wasn't getting very good grades, and um, it's kind of a long story and a difficult story, but um, I started skipping a lot of school. I never did my homework because if, I mean, I spent like seven hours in a classroom, and then I go home, and that's like the only time I have to code, so like, why am I going to do my homework? 
Um, and I mean, I don't think they knew how, like, what to make of it. Like, was I a bad student? Was I being rebellious? Or I mean, they knew that I was really fascinated with technology, but um, they also felt that there was something wrong. And I mean, for years, I thought that they, that everyone at my school were just terrible people, and I resented like all of them so much. But looking back on it now, I think everyone at my school cared and they wanted to do what was best for me. They just, I mean, it's just something that, that's totally new for there to be like so much competition for public schooling. And I don't think anyone's prepared to deal with that. Um, I mean, at an early age, I was like, because, I mean, I started programming when I was, like, 10. So at an early age, I was diagnosed with ADD, that usual thing, um, and, like, placed on meds for that, put in, like, special ed, and it just became this big bureaucratic mess. And the more they tried to treat my lack of motivation, uh, the more motivated I felt to just, like, not go to school. Because when I went home and I was focusing on my own work, um, no one was telling me there was something wrong with me. I could just sit down, study, get stuff done, and feel good about myself. Those are profound comments, I gotta say. Um, others, thoughts, questions for Nick? I have a question um, for uh, Nick. Was there a moment uh, in your history of public schooling where you were really engaged? Um, I did take one computer class, and that was pretty awesome. I made this Space Invaders kind of game, and um, <laughs> I would say that was engaging. Um, and for a while I was sick and I had to be homeschooled because I was contagious with like mono or something and it was weird. Uh, I always hated history but this one teacher would come to my place and teach me about history and I got really interested in like the Civil War for a while. And to this day I don't really know exactly what it was. Maybe it was just that it was a one-on-one -on -one teaching thing but yeah that was another uh, example of me being really engaged let me circle back to Alex's question have you ever had a chance to teach what you know have I had a chance to teach um, not really I mean I've like helps people out online a little bit, but um, I've never had a chance to really teach someone from start to finish like how to uh, how to code or anything like that. I've been offered a job doing that, which would have been interesting, but um, <laughs> but no, I haven't. Lisa. You're popping up because you're typing. Do you have a thought? Um, yeah, I have a, th and also I'm sorry. I was trying to type don't quietly, worry. but I don't know how to just don't mute worry. my typing. So I'm gonna have to don't figure worry. that out. It's fine. I'm having audio difficulties. Um, well, a few things. One is I, unlike Nick, who had one class that engaged him in school, I had zero so at least you had one that's good but I think that it's really a travesty that perhaps you're lucky enough to have a school or a class that engages you and today with there there's just so many ways to learn um, without the force of school or the subjects that are being imposed upon you that young people or anyone can really have the freedom to learn what it is that they want and what 
that they're interested in. And I think that we've really been conditioned to believe that there's this one path. And when people realize, um, which they are a bit, that you never needed to be forced to learn in this boring way stuck in a classroom, which might work for some people, but many people it's very difficult. Um, they could be, they're often like me, like, wow, I can't believe I was sold this bill of goods. It could have been so much better. My time could have been so much more productive. So that's a message I'm trying to um, share with more and more people. And I think that the students who are opting out of school to find success should be supported in achieving their personal learning goals. And I believe in students, and when they're supported properly, they will achieve the success that they are interested in achieving. Any thoughts I on have how to we interject, do that? Lisa, and ask a quick question. And I'm asking this partially in, in, in the side of my brain that's totally cheering you on and agreeing with you and saying, yes, <laughs> absolutely. And the other part of my brain is saying that as adults and as people who have become literate and numerate and successful in engaging in civic discourse and building communities and having families, um, what responsibility do we have to quote, and I'll use your, your language, impose, quote, certain subjects, ideas, topics, um, ways of thinking on students? And I mean I, that I in a very we, generous type of way. I'm not trying to be sarcastic. I'm saying, like, as adults, we we do know some things about how the world works. So what responsibility do we have to share that with kids rather than just well, letting them go willy-nilly into the... Well, I, I wasn't um, suggesting willy-nilly, but for those of us, and I'm, I lost track of who has what career, but when you work with young people, you know they're extremely concerned about community, the environment, doing things that matter. The, these are things that are naturally within children. What kills their creativity is, you know, what's driving our education today, which is um, a test prep curriculum that's standardized to force children to fill in bubble tests, taking classes by people that they never chose to take classes from, learning subjects that they never asked to learn. I don't believe that we should be forcing or imposing children to do things, um, it, you know, of course, if someone is hurting someone, that is not a good thing. But if we give students the freedom to learn, they will amaze us. I've, been, I've studied thousands of cases where this is the case. Students rise to the occasion. And there are schools and curriculum that allow this, schools such as one which was mentioned, Summerhill or Sudbury, curriculum such as the school-wide enrichment model. These are extremely successful. One thing that um, some don't like is that they don't make the test prep and publishing industry billions of dollars a year. These uh, systems empower educators to assess students, to help them find their passion and reward. You know, you're really rewarded by doing well because the parents and the students uh, believe in the work that's being done and school principals are assessing teachers. So that's, in a nutshell, I believe that we need to believe in our children and they will flourish. We've got one Teresa, of those students with ask, us now. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But I wanted to ask so, Teresa. Kelsey. Can you hear me? I'm... Yeah, I can, your audio is a little faint, Paul. It's, yeah, sorry. Teresa, can you talk about doing things that we don't want to do sometimes? Mm. <laughs> doing things we don't want to do? Well, um, let's see. In the chat um, room, you talked about that. Oh, uh, well, you know, I, and I guess, you know, I'm looking at this, um, um, I think like Troy said, I'm looking at, you know, as obviously I'm a teacher, I, I'm biased. I've done this for 21 years. So, um, but I'm also the mom of four boys. Um, and so, you know, I, I go back and forth. I certainly want them to have some different experiences than they're having in their schooling. Um, but I don't, no, looking at my four boys and how very different they are, I, I can't say 
worried about saying we should do it this way. And that's the answer. And I think it was, I'm sorry, I think it's Alex, is that his name, talked about the fact that, that you know, the problem right now is we have this, this one system in which we're trying to cram everybody. And so when we talk about the need to offer something different, I get worried because sometimes we talk to like, we have to do it all different and every kid is disengaged and everybody doesn't want this. And I don't see that. And I talk to my students all the time. Um, so, you know, and I also know from my own boys that some days there are things that they're learning that they're like, I don't want to do this. And I'm like, you know, let me tell you why that skill is important. Or let me tell you why working with that group is important, even if that's not your favorite thing right now. Let's have a dialogue about that. And then I also worry, and I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to phrase this the best that I can. Uh, I'm looking at my screen here. And, and I currently work with a program that works with students of color. The students I work with are African American, Latino, and Burmese refugee students. And so sometimes I think too that when we have these big discussions, we honestly come at it from a white middle class perspective. And I think that that's something that we have, I don't think, I know that it is something that we have to think about when we're saying that it has to be this way. Because every kid sitting in our schools that we might want to redefine it all for them doesn't have the same experiences. And so, you know, once again, I go back to that. I don't think there's one right different way to do it. And so I'm always cautious in the conversations of making sure that that is a part of what I'm thinking about. But that, you know, that's my personal perspective. I, I would also add to that, you know, my, my little brother went to the same high school I did, same middle school I did, had a, many, many, many of the same teachers and had the exact opposite experience. He hated it, he didn't do that well, and, you know, wasn't a big fan. It wasn't until much later that he figured out the things he was interested in and wanted to do in school and in college and all that stuff. And, you know, they could have changed the whole system and made it better for him, and I might have hated it. So I totally agree that, you know, it is very much, you know, allowing for flexibility, allowing, you know, to allow teachers to actually listen to their individual students, you know, give them that flexibility and those kind of things. And um, I also think, you know, these, these discussions are fantastic to stimulate thought and to engage, you know, and meet new people and, and see what everybody's doing. Um, I'd also like to hear what, you know, like, you know, we heard from, like, Nick talked about his, what he did. Um, you know, this is, I saw this thing, I was in school, it wasn't stimulating me, so I dropped out and I went and this is what I did. What are, you know, in people's experience, what is everybody actually doing to overcome these problems, to tackle these problems? What programs are you implementing? What thoughts are you having? Um, you know, and things like that. Because I know for me directly, like a lot of these thoughts and concerns and conversations I have and directly out of that came our school, which is a very tangible thing. And so I'd like to, you know, hear more about other people's opportunities and ideas and things like that for actually affecting change or implementing things or trying stuff out. Yes? It was a raised hand. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with Teresa in that it's not not working for everybody. The system now works for me. I think it would be more interesting a different way, but it works for me now. But I know some people that it doesn't work for. So I don't know if it changed that if it would work for them, but not for me. I don't know if it would be pretty much the same thing, just with different groups of people. I'm thinking we're in an era that um, we get a we get to play the game of and. I don't think it's an either or. I don't think we have to pick the top ten. I think um, we are in a time now that um, it's whatever, and our work is focusing on a process of learning, um, and just that. And that means you can do whatever. You know, there can be people who like school just as it is that are doing that. The only difference is. 
everyone that gathers in that space or wherever to, to, to learn whatever, they've all chosen to be there. The compulsory piece is, is gone. Um, Alex, when, when you're talking about um, some things that are working, you know, uh, I'm in a private school, a Catholic school, and so I don't have the testing pressure that a lot of my public school colleagues have. So that opens up a lot of time. And then I'm in a small room. Um, one of the rooms I teach in is really small, so I can only have uh, 13 students at a time when I teach those classes. And those are like photography and media classes. And in those cases, I get a lot of students, the parents will say like, you know, this is the first time this person is actually clicking in school. And I think about those conditions, small classes yeah. and not having to worry about testing. And I think, you know, good for me, but I realize the constraints that are on everybody else. Um, and those two things I've kind of isolated as really nice things for helping people engage. Yeah. And to be candid, I went to a small private high school as well. So, you know, it was a lot of classes of 10, 15 people um, and a lot of flexibility on the teachers. Uh, you know, the teachers had a lot of flexibility. So I think that was a big reason why I enjoyed it. And so, you know, we've talked in the chat room a little bit about just the, you know, everybody knows the billions of dollars that goes into testing and all that stuff. And, you know, if, if every school could have the opportunity to not spend so much money there and to lower class size, I mean, I guess that's the perfect world I'm thinking about. But those conditions seems really important to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but I also think, I mean, I'm in North Carolina now, but I taught in California in a really large district for 17 years. And by no means do I think I was a perfect teacher, nor do by any means do I think that I engaged and reached every kid. Um, it doesn't mean that I didn't try. It doesn't mean that I didn't reflect on why I couldn't and why I didn't. But, you know, I can remember one of my favorite classes that I had my last year I was there. I had 43 seniors in one English class. And you know what? Those kids told me this was awesome. They still, you know, they Facebook message me. Mrs. Bunner, I remembered what you taught us about this in my class that I'm sitting in now. And so I think that, yes, in a perfect world, we could line everything up the way we want it. But I'm also going to challenge that I think that there are still things that we could do starting tomorrow morning at eight o'clock in the morning or whenever our students arrive that would make things different for our kids. And are we, I guess my thing is, are we having those conversations too? As we're having these big world mm -hmm. issue questions, are we also having those, those conversations with each other and challenging each other to greet kids at the door, to know kids' names and what they prefer to be called, to building in as much student choice as we can within our classrooms each day, to dialoguing with our kids so that when things aren't going well in class, do we invite the experts in? And that's those 43 kids or however many sitting in my classroom. If I don't ask them for help with making it work for them, if I don't ask their parents who know them far better than I do when they walk in my classroom, then I've missed some really key opportunities as far as I'm concerned. So I like having the big discussions like this, but I also think that I can walk in tomorrow if, you know, I'm, not, I'm out of the classroom this year, but I could walk in tomorrow and I better think about what worked and what didn't work the day before and I need to, to fix it and make it better and make it engaging, make it relevant, make it whatever it needs to be for those 43 individuals sitting in my class because you know what, they deserve that. And that needs to be my attitude as a public education teacher. What my question for you is what if they have absolutely no interest in the topic? Then, you know, I, I'm not sure I know how to answer that, Lisa. Um, I think it depends on the topic. I think, um, you know, if I'm talking to kids about, you know, communicating in a business style, 
you know, I, I want to make that as relevant as I can. I think if they're they're not interested in it, then we need to build some of those alternate places. Um, but I think there's a lot I can do in the classroom to make that topic interesting, relevant, engaging, whatever catchword that you want to use for it. And it's not always going to be the case. And I just have one other question, I guess, it based kind of piggybacking on what you said and and the original question there and I wrote this in the chat as well but there are already many many models that do exactly what we're talking about um, that are engaging relevant focus on children's or young people's passions talents interests abilities however the government refuses to fund those models those are only set aside for privileged people who can afford those sort of settings and to me, can, can you name those models, key. please, Lisa? Sure, what what sure. are you talking uh, about specifically? Yeah, yeah, models such as Montessori, Reggio Emilia, um, uh, democratic slash free schools, uh, and there's you know numerous big picture schools, um, Nuestra Escuela schools. There's dozens of these, but the government refuses to fund them. So these models exist, but they are for the privileged and not for public school students. And I think when we get to that, that's when we start getting to the crux of our real problem. I still, I still would challenge that a little bit, though, and say that, well, not challenge it, but I would say that you know, when you have 20 people in a room there's still something that you can do. Um, and there's still an opportunity there to, to engage. I, like, you know, I would like to have the opportunity to have as many options for everybody as possible. There's also the reality of going to school tomorrow and you know, doing what you have to do. Um, and I think both discussions are very relevant and important. Um, and I think you know, if you think about it as you know, things that maybe we do more as I mean think about the last dinner party you went to with 20 people um, all 20 people aren't interesting right uh, you probably had a longer conversation with one or two of them than you know you didn't have a five minute stimulating conversation with every single person there and I think that there's a there's just a reality to human nature too that you're not gonna love everybody and you're not gonna love every experience and hopefully you will find some that you do um, and if you don't Hopefully there will be, and we can start to try to put in a place alternatives um, to that, you know, and ways to to, to engage or to disengage, um, because I don't think there should be such a stigma as there is right now about about you know dropping out, um, which I still think is a terrible word for that action, because it's just it has so much negative connotations. You know, I dropped out of college three times, um, <laughs> and. It, you know, it wasn't something that I thought of as dropping out. It was, I'm going to go do something else for a while, and when I find something I want to do, whether it's in school or out of school, I'm going to go do that. Uh, and I think, you know, those are all kind of, uh, it, it, to me, it's flexibility, and it's listening, um, and it's taking every opportunity you can find to, to engage with somebody, you know? I, I guess I'm just going to jump in and say one other thing. I think too often teachers and parents are not feeling empowered and I think they need to stand up, speak up, and know that they, not the government, should be owning the learning. And I don't think that um, parents or young people or teachers should agree to be forced to comply to things that they know are not the best for children. And so along those lines, and the, the research that Alex and Ruby came out of, and that we did as well, looking at homeless people and saying, what's best for them? Well, it's best if they own it. Something that we can do tomorrow in our classes is um, maybe a, a different version of a flipped classroom where it's not just trading things out, but it's a, a flipped mindset and saying, who does own this? And, if we are in a, in a system that we can't change right now and we've got standardized tests, giving them the stuff they have to do and letting them own it, letting them just, you know, teach each other, use the resources that they have, um, learn it in whatever way, but give, do give them back that time and say, you know, be honest and frank with them and say, this is the stuff you need right now and, and give them that. I think 
I think the ownership piece is huge that Lisa brings up and that um, we find that choice, that choice is how we empower people and that's what we want at the public school. We want people to be empowered. Nick, go ahead and close us out. Give us some more of your profile. All right. Um, on the topic of uh, the government owning education, um, shortly before I dropped out, because public education is compulsory, um, I would skip a lot of school. And there were times where I would hide in the woods while the cops looked for me because I preferred self-education over public education. So I totally agree that the government should not own my education, nor should they enforce it. It was crazy being treated like a criminal because I wanted to uh, make a different choice than the one that, that the government gave me. Um, it was insane. And um, on the topic of ideas, um, I can tell you that self-educating for all these years, my biggest problem was uh, probably just not learning because that's always easy. Just go to Google, type in whatever you're looking for, but learning what to learn because you need to know what to type into Google. So my idea that I've had for years that I've started working on on weekends is um, just like a, a database full of educational resources and the subjects that are related to them and the careers that are related to those subjects. So you can say, I want to be a programmer and I know a little bit of basic math. What do I need to read? And to get just like an auto-generated curriculum would be huge. That's what I was missing. That's what I've always wanted. So that's my contribution to the whole idea thing. That's awesome. Are you sharing that yet? Are you sharing that yet? Do you have a, a link you could let us see it, or is it still? In... It's still a little stealthy. <laughs> OK. Well, let us know. Yeah. Can't hear you, Paul. <laughs> Is he wanting you to close out? I think Paul has lost audio and would like yeah. someone to make some closing comments, please. <laughs> I think I like I like Nick's closing comments. I think we're good at that. So Chris, do you know that the little we've been yes. dealing with? Yes. We do want to thank uh, Dave Cormier. <laughs> and Jeff Lebo at the World Bridges uh, Network. That's what uh, we broadcast on here at EdTech Talk. Uh, and next week we are going to be talking about open education resources. So I think, um, Nick, your last comment there is, um, you know, this, this whole movement about making education open, which, you know, a lot of us here are already doing. Uh, we're going to continue that next week with um, some people who are organizing the Open Education Resource Week, I believe it's called, which is March 5th through the 10th. Big thanks to all you guys who came tonight. Appreciate it. And Paul has assigned that. <laughs> <laughs> Night, guys. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Uh, Thank you all.